It's your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Well, I want you to know as um, your pastor, those who braved this cold, wet, rainy, mushy weather we've got out there, you get a gold star today. Um, those who are joining us online, we're so glad you're here. So you get a silver star. Um, just kidding. Um, we're, everybody gets a gold star. This is, this is God's house. And so we're glad you're here. Um, now, I want to let you all know that the next three weeks, we're going to do um, our Bolverde Basis class. This is our membership class. And you're saying, wait a second, Pastor, seriously? Like, we're going to do the, the membership class? Like, I've been a member here for 30 years. Yes. I promise you, you have something that you will learn or something that you need to be reminded of. But the other thing is there's some of us who say, we've been in this church for 10, 12 years and we've yet to become a member. Um, we just kept putting it off and you know, well, I'm kind of, you know, member by osmosis. And um, some of us sit here and think, well, you know, I think I'm a member, I'm not really sure. Um, and so at the end of this series, we'll have a document that you can fill out. And if you've never filled out that document, then I promise you, you're, you know, I promise, I probably good call that you're not a member. So just go ahead and fill it out. You've been through our Bulverde Basics class. You know what it takes to be a member. Um, and so what I wanna do is teach you these things because there's a lot of us who have never been through this. Um, this is a class that Dick um, has started when he was their pastor and we kind of formulated it and revamped it. And as things change, this class has changed. And I'd venture to say, if you've joined the church uh, within the last three years, you've probably been through this, but if it's been longer than three years, you've not been through this class um, or you may have forgotten some things on there. So we're gonna take a real practical approach. Uh, not a lot of um, exegetical teaching going on here, but it's, I think it's pertinent and good, useful information for all of us today. So first thing I wanna do is introduce um, our church staff to you. Um, there we go, technology is gonna catch up here just a second, there we go. So you see, uh, this is our ministerial staff. We've got two pages of them. We've got myself, um, Flor Flornoy and Darren Miles. Darren's our worship pastor, uh, Phil's our associate pastor. Um, I've been on staff since uh, October, 2006. Um, my lead pastor anniversary comes up in February. So I'll have completed two years this coming February as pastor. Phil's been our associate pastor. He's done pretty much everything there is in the church. He's held every job title, either officially or unofficially in the church. He's been on staff here for this May will be 33 years. And then Darren has been here for, I think, three years. Uh, he's completing three years, starting four years, coming up uh, pretty soon. And so that's uh, some of our ministerial staff. The other ones we have up here is Robbie East, Lachelle Fox, and Deborah Stovall. Uh, Robbie's coming up on a year with us. And um, Lachelle's actually came about two months before I did. She came in August um, of uh, 2006 as our children's minister. And um, Deborah Stovall is our nursery and MDO director. Now you say, Paul, why do I need to know these people? I don't have kids in the nursery. I don't need to know who the nursery director is. I would tell you, I think you do. Because there's a good chance you may run into someone in your neighborhood or at the local grocery store or, or one of your outings that you have and you hang out with people and they're gonna have a kid or a grandkid and you're gonna need to say, oh, you know what? Our church does have a nursery and we have someone who oversees that and her name is Deborah and she is awesome. So you're right, you may not have kids in the nursery, but as a member of Boulevard Baptist Church, we want you to be able to be educated on who's who and who does what. Now we have several support staff members. I broke these up in two categories. This is our media side of things. This is Craig O'Neill. It's our AV, AVL director, which basically means audio, visual, and lighting, which means anything that happens on a Sunday morning, he oversees it. He's kind of the director of Sunday mornings. He gets to, you know, when the lights come up, when they go down, uh, uh, those kinds of things. Tanner Davis is our media and graphic designer. So anything that goes on our screens, logos, social media posts, all those things, uh, Tanner does those things. These guys are the biggest unsung sung heroes of some of our staff that, because they only get noticed when things don't get done right. When something's misspelled or when a slide doesn't get quick enough, you're like, Jesus, oh, I didn't miss that word. Everybody does this. Everybody looks to the back. That's when these guys were like, oh man, you know, and they got a whole team that works with them and makes and helps them be successful every week. But these are some really creative guys. Uh, they really think outside the box on a lot of things. And we're so blessed to be able to add this kind of uh, format to our staff. And these are our front office ladies. These are probably the most fun people in our church staff, not to discredit anyone else, but they are the most fun, but you also don't wanna get on their bad side. 
Um, uh, because they answer the phones for you and they write your checks for you. And so therefore we wanna make sure we're really nice to them. But Stacy Pullen is our new administrative assistant. That's a fancy way of saying church secretary. She took over this last year as Judy retired. Judy spent 12 years as our administrative assistant and, and Stacy's uh, stepped into that role and is doing a really good job. And then Margie Pipkin is our bookkeeper and she does everything budget wise, uh, bookkeeper wise. She's the one who comes to us and says, hey, uh, so how are you gonna pay for that? I'm like, well, uh, what code do I use? You know, that kind of thing. She keeps us in line. She does a really great job in keeping our finances in order. And then the other thing we have here, we have our custodial and maintenance staff. Now, Diana is our lead custodian. We have a whole staff, a whole team that works on our, our church to help keep everything sanitized and clean and picked up. And Diana leads this team. Um, she works with uh, several of her friends and family members to do this. And uh, she's been involved in our church for over 12 years, cleaning our church. And just new to our staff is uh, Dan East. Uh, he's our maintenance uh, guy. And so he is helping oversee anything that's going wrong. So I know some of you guys were a little cold in your class. Uh, the heaters weren't working correctly. So Dan will come in the office tomorrow morning at nine o'clock and he'll have a little piece of paper on his desk for me going, education building is cold for some reason. And Dan will get on that. He's uh, got his license in heating and AC and refrigeration. So that's nice to, to have on our staff. So that's kind of who our church staff is. You say, well, why do we know all this? Well, I want you to be informed of who is working here at the church, who's doing what, where they're doing those things. I want you to be educated. This is your church. This is not a place that you just show up and it's spoon fed you a good message every other week or hopefully a good message every other week. This is your church. You are invested. You help make this thing run. And these are some of the paid staff members that help also do these things. And I want you to be aware of that. Now, our Baptist roots. Now, why are we spending time talking about what does it mean to be a Baptist? I mean, shouldn't we be more concerned about being a Christian than a Baptist? Well, yes, I would agree with you, except for when we do our Bulverde Basics class, one out of every 10 people usually are coming from or familiar with the Baptist church, which lets you know if we purport to you, we had 70 people join our church this last year. On a, on a rule of thumb, you can realize that probably 63 of those people had no idea what a Baptist church is or coming from a Baptist church. You say, well, is that really a big deal? Well, it is if you're talking about doctrine. It is if you're talking about, you know, philosophy of ministry and how, how the church is set up and how it runs and, and orchestrates itself. It is very important. So we spent a lot of time in our Bulverde Basic class talking about what it is to be a Baptist and what it looks like to be a Baptist. Now you'll see up here on the screen, you've got this uh, uh, diagram. And so as a Southern Baptist, and there are other Baptists, there's independent Baptists, there's, uh, um, oh, what does what, someone say something? Missionary. Missionary Baptists. There's a lot of different other Baptists. We're a Southern Baptist church. So with that, we have a national Southern Baptist convention. It's one of the largest evangelical uh, conventions there are in the world, um, especially in our nation. And so we belong to the Southern Baptist Convention, the SBC. Um, with that, we have a, a state convention, the Southern Baptist of Texas, SBTC. Now over here, you see another state convention. It's kind of grayed out. That is the BGCT, the Baptist General Convention of Texas. Years ago, there was a... a, a, a split, for lack of a better word, to the state convention between more progressive or more conservative viewpoints when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to um, church function, church roles, um, ordaining women, different things like that in the church. And so the BGC took a more progressive stance and the Southern Baptist of Texas took a more conservative stance. And when Dick was the pastor here 18 years ago, the church was duly aligned as with most churches were at that time. So Bulverde Baptist Church said, hey, we want to know, should we be dually aligned or should we be singular aligned and which convention? So Dick took on that job his first couple of years as pastor here. And so 17 years ago, the church decided to be singularly, singularly aligned with the Southern Baptist of Texas. Now, I don't want you to understand something. I don't believe the BCT is a bad organization. They do great, great work. The guy who preached my ordination service was the president of the BGCT at the time, Dr. Jeff Johnson. I think they do great work. They've got great curriculum. They've got great uh, church training. They've got a lot of great things out there. It's just where do we really line and where do we see <clears throat> doctrinally things line up? 
we as a church just decided to be more aligned with the SBTC. So when you see something great out here, don't think it's bad. A matter of fact, even here locally, we have a Blue Bonnet Association, and then we also have our San Antonio Baptist Association. Years ago, because our church was birthed out of uh, Delview Baptist Church, we'll talk about that in a second, they were belonged to Saba. Well, as we began to do more interaction with other local churches, we were obviously doing more with the hill country areas, Canyon Lake, New Braunfels, you know, uh, Blanco, those kinds of things. And they were belonging to the Blue Bonnet Association. So by default, we just spent more time with them. And over the course of the years, since we realized we spent more time and we spent more resources with them, we started giving them more funding. And three years ago, we decided, well, it's been eight years since we've done anything with Saba, we just decided to not fund Saba. That doesn't mean San Antonio Baptist Associ Association. It's a bad association. It's a great association. We just decided to give our funds, our resources, and our time and energy to the Blue, Bon Blue Bonnet Association. J.K. Mitten was the director of missions of our Blue Bonnet Association when Dick became the pastor. Later on, Robbie Partain took over that position, and I work closely both with J.K. Mitten and Robbie Partain. I sit on the missions advisory team at the Blue Bonnet Association, which basically means I help do uh, planning and strategic planning for churches and and pastors in the area. I also sit on the, the church planning uh, committee, which uh, with the church, uh, our North American Mission Board, which is associated with this convention, decides to plant a church, let's say in Blanco, they would contact us. I would sit on a team with other pastors and our director of missions and the state convention. And we would talk about the need to plant this church. What was their vision? What is their passion? What are they doing? Who's gonna be a part of this, the, the birth of this church? Who's gonna be the sponsoring church? And I'm part of the interview council process um, with our local association when it comes to church planning. So if you heard words like International Mission Board or IMB, we just collected almost 22 or a little over $22,000 as a church for Lottie Moon. Our goal was 10 and we did $22,000. That money was through our IMB or International Mission Board. The great thing about being a Baptist is we don't have to serve fully fund A or two missionaries across the world. We're able to serve thousands of missionaries across the world because we pull our resources along with First Baptist Blanco and First Baptist New Braunfels and First Baptist San Antonio and all these other like-minded Baptist churches pull all their resources together so we're able to fund missionaries worldwide. Not only in our North American Mission Board, again, a part of the National Convention, NAMB, they do state uh, missions, our, our North American missions, church planning, those kinds of things. Um, we, we help partner with them and we raise funds and our missionaries, uh, we, we help support that. So by being a Southern Baptist, we're able to take our resources and multiply it across the nation. I uh, ran to someone one time and we were talking, they're like, I can never be a Baptist. I was like, why? Why can't you be a Baptist? They're like, well, there's too many rules. It's like, what, what rules are you talking about? That gave me a bunch of, you know, malarkey rules. And like, I just want to be a part of a church that really cares about the kingdom, like getting the gospel out and spreading the good news. I was like, well, you need to be a Baptist. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to be a Baptist because I, I don't want someone to come in and trying to tell me how to run a church. Our church should be set up and, and trust. I'm like, oh, well, that's exactly what a Baptist church is. And as they begin to describe all the things that are frustrated with churches, kind of find out that their philosophy of what a church should look like more aligned with the Baptist church than anything else. So people say, well, are, you, are you proud to be a Baptist? Yes, I'm more proud to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Baptist is just how I choose to flesh that out and in in, in do kingdom work. What I see to, to be understand through uh, the, the, the scriptures and those kinds of things. Um, there we go, hello. It spazzed out on me, there we go, we're good. Um, so. What we wanted to do is, is let them know that this is, this is what a Baptist church looks like. So this is kind of our, our national, our state, and our local conventions. And our local convention has a, uh, their mission statement is assisting churches. Right now, if I was to say, hey, you know what? Something happened to Paul. He can't preach for the next six weeks. I can call our local association and they will fill, pulpit supply our church free of charge for as long as they need to. That's what they do. If we're looking for, you know, Resources. Hey, we're looking at hiring this guy. Matter of fact, we did this when we were looking through hiring different, uh, our youth minister. They gave us a couple of job descriptions to kind of help way over and look over. They also allowed us to get the message out. We sent an email to every church in the area saying, hey, we're looking for a youth pastor. That's how Robbie found out about us was through the local association. 
Um, so this, these are great resources that we belong to. Now, the thing is, is none of these avenues, none of these resources dictate who we are as a church. We're autonomous. And we'll get to that in just a second. So you say, well, what is a Baptist? If someone asked me, say, what is a Baptist? Well, first of all, understand the Baptist church was established um, in America by a guy named Roger Williams in 1630. Baptist was not created by Jesus Christ. Baptist was not created by John the Baptist. Okay, we are not a, a one leg up on all the other evangelical churches because our roots tie all the way back to Jesus himself. Like, no, there was a guy who had a philosophy of ministry, created the, the Baptist faith and created that in 1630, Roger Williams. Now, the Baptists typically hold to these several things. Uh, first is that the members have credible evidence they've been born again. In order to be a member of Bulverde Baptist Church, there needs, needs to be credible evidence that you've been born again. You've been saved, you've been redeemed, you've been made a new, a, a new creation. You've asked Jesus into your heart, all these other phrases that we would use in the church. But my life has now been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and I'm a child of God. In order to be a member, that is key. Second thing is baptism is by immersion and it's only after salvation. You say, well, pastor, I've got a question. I was baptized when I was three. We'll talk about that in a second. But baptism, a Baptist, what is a Baptist? A member, someone is who in order to hold membership is, is saved. Second of all is baptism is by immersion and only after salvation, not, not a sprinkle, but an immersion or a dunk. And the third thing is that communion or the Lord's Supper is observed by believers in Christ. Okay, so... We let anyone take the Lord's Supper here. We don't have to be a member. We don't check membership before you come in and look and say, you know, name, place. You know, okay, here you go. Here's your elements. We set them on the back of the table and ask that you would remember them on your way in every other month. Basically, the odd number of months, the first Sunday of those months. So basically, March, the first Sunday of March, we'll have Lord's Supper. So some of y'all can now know the routine of when to expect it kind of thing. But those are the three. Here's a couple more. One is that each church is autonomous. Ours is under congregational rule. You say, what's autonomous? Autonomous means we are set up as our own entity. Those conventions I just told you earlier, Robbie Partain, the National Convention, J.D. Greer, the president, none of those people will come to Bulverde Baptist Church and say, by the way, you need to take this children's minister and you, you know, we're gonna move Lachelle to Oklahoma. Like we're not gonna give her a choice, we're just gonna pick her up and move her because we, she thinks she's doing such a great job. There's another church that needs her resources and her talents, we're gonna move her. No one's gonna come in here and, and move us. The only one that moves us out of position is God or this local church. Me feeling called to go somewhere else is someone else feeling called to leave and go to another church by the call of God or the church saying, I don't think this is working out anymore, you need to go. Um, that's always harder for a church to go through than the other, I get it, but those are the two ways that people are removed from a staff position. No one is coming in here and saying, this person's now your youth pastor, or this one's now your pastor. We hope you like him, he got him for three years or eight years or whatever it may be. That's not how our church works. Our budgets are set up a certain way. We're not, none of these conventions up here tell us how much money we have to give to them every year. They don't say, well, what's your budget at? Well, our budget's $1.3 million. Well. $250,000 of that has to come to this convention, period. And after that, then you can do ministry. No one comes to our church. This church, it's, it's congregational rule. I like to tell people it's pastor-led congregational rule, which is the way I explain it. And, and I do this in my Bulverde Basis class. It, it's kind of like in a, in a family, you've got the, the mom and dad. So mom and dad are kind of like setting the direction like, hey, this is what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna do at dinners at five. But Congregational rule means the kids get to decide what they want, if they like it for dinner or not. I mean, I can say, hey, here's what we're doing as a church, but the church automatically gets to say, well, we like that or we don't like that because it's congregational rule, which means we vote on all the decisions we're doing as a congregation before we decide to sell this or buy that, or we wanna use this much money for missions or this much money for youth ministry. No one decides that. I can set up and say, hey, I think we should invest more of our resources here. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the church votes on the budget. So it may be pastor led, but it's congregational rule and it's autonomous, meaning no other outside entities come in and tell this church who should be here, what its core value should be, how much money should go here, how much money should go there. It's all done within our own church. 
And the other thing is that the practice of doctrine is based on the inerrant word of God, which means that this Bible has no errors and in it is giving us all the resources we need to make our decisions. We're not gonna look at church history as, our, as, a, as a defining factor. Well, for, for centuries, churches have done this, so we're gonna adopt this as tradition. We're gonna say, if we're gonna adopt it as tradition, let's see it in the word of God. For instance, the baptism, and we'll get to that in, in just a second. So what is the history of Boulevardy Baptist Church? Do we have a history? Do we just show up one day? Well, absolutely, we did not just show up one day. We started as a VBS opportunity from Delview Baptist Church, 1973. They said, hey, let's host a VBS out in this area and see if there's a need for a Baptist church. Delview did that, we had a VBS. Later on that August, we had our first worship service out at um, where Walmart is now, at Singing Hills Ranch. We had the first worship service and later on uh, became affiliated. And you know, a couple years later, we built um, our own building out here, which is now the student auditorium. So that's a little bit of our history. And now we're coming up on 50 years in the, and soon I told the first service, I said, you know what, for our 50th anniversary, we should just go shut Walmart down one Sunday and just set up church in their parking lot and be like, hey, this is where it all started. You know, just have church at Walmart parking lot. Some laughed, some thought it was a good idea. It's like a chuckle and an amen. So I'm really sure what that was like, but um, you guys are even quieter than them. So that is um, kind of the history. Now we've had, I'm the ninth pastor since 1973, this church has had. So we've not had an extreme amount of turnover. Now there were some years where turnover was shorter, but we just had a long tenure from our former pastor, Dick Loser, who was here for 17 years leading and shepherding this church. Now, what about baptism? I've hinted on this a couple of times now. What, what is baptism? Well, baptism is the public declaration that an individual has been born again and is a new creation. This act of obedience is symbolic in nature, representing the old life being buried and the new life being raised up. Well, what about infant baptism? I've heard that word baptism. People said, oh, I got baptized when I was three, or I got baptized when I was a baby. I'm not gonna try to start a fight with anyone or get into some little theological war, but the, the idea here is that when we look into the New Testament and we read the word baptism, and we look at the Greek word is always translated as baptismo, which means to immerse or to submerge. Matter of fact, if, if, a, if a lady was dyeing garments from white to purple, they were like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I've got to baptismo these garments so I can get them to become purple. I've got to submerge them and dip them. I've got to put them under so they can become a different color. And so that word baptismo, baptized or baptismo we see throughout the New Testament when someone has already been saved. So we don't perform an infant baptism here. What we do is we do a parent dedication. You used to call it a baby dedication, but realistically it's the parents dedicating themselves saying, we believe, you know, Jesus is Lord of our life and we want to live our life to honor him. And we're going to do the very best we can to raise this child of ours in a godly manner. And we're asking the church to hold us accountable and help us give us the tools and the resources to do that. In that moment uh, at a baby's baptism, the parent's faith is what is being displayed at that moment, not the baby's. But we see all throughout the New Testament that the, in a baptism, it's the person's faith their own faith being displayed. We see here in Acts chapter eight, starting in verse 35, it says, then Philip opened his mouth and it began with his scripture and he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road and they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? So we see Philip presents the, the gospel message. The eunuch goes, well, there's water. And then we find out here, I almost swiped the TV. That would have been awkward. Um, and then he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water. Notice he didn't say, scooped it up with his hand, cupped it with his hand, or got a ladle and drew some. This is they both went down into the water and Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him, he baptismo, he immersed him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. So we see here, the gospel was presented, there was a life change and then there was baptized and there was 
an immersion going on. Now, here's another one here in Acts chapter 16. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must me do? What must I do to be saved? Notice salvation is the very first thing we're talking about here. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And your whole, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. Then, oh, there we go. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once. So again, we see the gospel presentation, the life change, and then the baptism. We're not seeing anywhere in the new church where there's a baptism and later on someone comes to know who Jesus is. We see the gospel presented, a life change, baptism followed all throughout the New Testament. Last one's here is in Acts chapter 18. Christmas, the ruler of the synagogue believed in the Lord together with his entire and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized, Acts 18. We're seeing a, a constant progression here in, in faith, which is someone has presented the gospel, there's a life change, and then we see baptism. See, these are doctrinal truths that we as Boulevard Baptists hold to. And there's a lot of times that when we come to church, we, have, we sit in a small group of someone that's from another denomination who've been raised a different way. And if we never come as a church to say, hey, by the way, this is what we believe. This is what the word of God teaches. And this is where we stand. Then we find ourselves that later on, we could find ourselves divided rather than unified. See, we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says to the church of Corinth, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Christ Jesus, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you would be united in the same mind and the same judgment. You know, Paul's talking about unity here in the church. And we can disagree on whether we liked, you know, the, the yellow letters versus a, a, a pink letter, or maybe the font should have been a different f size. We, we can disagree on those kinds of things because none of those really matter. We can disagree whether we should have these panels up here. They should be a different color. They should be lighter or darker for the sound things. We can agree that the, the drums should be louder or they should be quieter or whatever. We can disagree in, in, on, on all those things because none of those really matter when it comes to building our life and following a teaching of the word of God. But when we say as a church, we're basing our beliefs out of the word of God, we need to be in unity on that. We need to be uh, in, in step with one another. We need to be together and on that. So I think it's important that we as Bullverde Baptist Church, if you've never been through this class, I'm glad you're going through it right now. I didn't really give you much option. Um, or if you have been through it just recently, what a great reminder and a great refresher. Now, I want you to know where this is a three-week series and we can, we're gonna go uh, this week, next week, we're gonna talk about doctrinal beliefs. What do we believe about who God is, the Holy Spirit, man, sin, eternal life. And then the last week, we're gonna talk about what it means to really belong to Boulevard Baptist Church. Um, what does it mean to get involved, to implement, to use our gifts, what's expected, what's required of us and to do that. So that's kind of what's gonna be. And at the end of this series, you're gonna be given an opportunity. You can join the church. You're like, just like that, Paul, just because they came and sat through a message, they can join the church. It's no different than coming and sitting in the class. Yes, absolutely. We're gonna give you the opportunity to fill out the form. And if you have been born again, you've been baptized, and you're willing to use your gifts and talents here at this church, and you wanna be a part of this, this congregation, we would accept that. And we would love to have you be a part of us as long as you understand what it means to be a Baptist. We're not here to adopt this church to your likings or to your theological thinkings. What we're here to do is that this is who God's called us to be. This is where God has called us to, to be. And this is what God has called us to do. And if none of that aligns up with you, I say this with much love. There are some amazing churches in this area that might fit you better. Some of them are my good friends. My, one of my good friends, John Heekenbein, pastors of the church just down the road, Riverside Community Church, great guy, love him to death. If this church doesn't fit with what you're thinking theologically, rather than coming and disrupting that, let's find a church that may fit with where you are and be a blessing to you as you could be a blessing to them. We're just one of many churches. I happen to think this is one of the greatest ones there is out here, if not the greatest. Um, we got a great staff. I think theologically we are sound. This church is set and primed to do great things. And I'm excited to be able to take you through the next three weeks of what it means 
to, uh, to be a part of Bull Verde Baptist Church. But we spent a lot of time today talking about baptism. Matter of fact, um, we had a baptism last week. It was a little cold. We've, the water's hot, uh, heated this week. Um, but we've got one today who was kind of in that moment, like, I'm a Christian, but I've, I've not been saved or not been baptized yet. So what does this look like? We get, begin to talk. And I want you to hear from uh, Mr. Tony Perez today. Uh, I couldn't tell you an exact amount, but I've been going here for a few years with my family and we've liked it here a lot. So, and then it's been kind of hard because I've been going to Lubbock, but anytime I'm down here, I try to make it out here every Sunday if I can. And it's always been good because I've never been much of a church going person. So I like going here now. What brought me here? Um, we were just searching for churches in the area and we found this one that, uh, wasn't too far away, and we have some neighbors and some friends that went here, so we thought it'd be a good thing to check it out, and we've been here ever since. Because we're called. Uh, I couldn't tell you an exact amount, but I've been going here for a few years with my family, and we've liked it here a lot, so. And then it's been kind of hard because I've been going to Lubbock, but anytime I'm down here, I try to make it out here every Sunday if I can. And it's always been good because I've never been much of a church going person. So I like going here now. What brought me here? Um, we were just searching for churches in the area and we found this one that uh, wasn't too far away. And we have some neighbors and some friends that went here. So we thought it'd be a good thing to check it out. And we've been here ever since. Because we're called to do it and from what I've heard, it's, it's, you know, we're called to do it as what the Lord Jesus tells us to do. And it's a great way to show your faith to the world. And I'm totally fine with doing that. That's what I should be doing. So I think if that's what I'm called to do, I'm going to do it. Simple as that. Well, Tony, you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, um, giving you freedom and victory over sin. And he lives in your heart for an ever and ever. Um, and with that declaration of your belief in Jesus Christ, it's your grandfather's privilege to baptize you as his brother in Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. It's not hard, it's not hurtful, it's actually very helpful. And I know there are several of us here today that you feel like maybe if you were to do this, you'd be kind of going back on your parents' teaching, the way they raised you. And uh, you kind of feel like you're dishonoring them. I just wanna lovingly tell you this. I think it would be better to honor Jesus and all things than anything else. And in his word, we clearly see that baptism is after the point of salvation. It's an, it's an immersion standpoint, symbolizing the death and burial of the old life and the resurrection of a new life. I hope that you won't let water stand in the way with you either being obedient to Jesus or becoming a member of Bull Verde Baptist Church. And if there's anything that I can do that I can pray with you about to encourage you. I'll be down here at the end of the service. Some of our deacons and our staff will be. We'd love to encourage you, love to answer any questions you have. But that being said, let's stand and we'll close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be, belong to such a great body. God, you have blessed this church tremendously. Your hand is on this church and we see you doing great things. We've seen an entire family who recognize the need to be obedient through baptism. We see Tony today recognizing the need to be obedient through baptism. Lord, I pray that you would continue to teach us what it means to be obedient to you. Whether that's being through, falling through with baptism, uniting our family, ourselves with this church, inviting our neighbors to church or sharing our faith with those in our family or that we work with. Use us as we leave this place. Let the gospel message not be sealed up in our lips, but let it be come forth to everyone we meet and talk to. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. You guys drive safe and have a wonderful, wonderful week.